Welcome back to Impactology Live for our second day. My name is Rita Chincotta and I'm joined by George Liberopoulos. We are really pleased to be kicking off a full day of fantastic speakers with you again today. Now this morning's guest is a really, really special guest um, for us, Rula Christie from Houston. Welcome to Impactology Live, Rula. Hey guys, thanks so much for having me. This is exciting. It is very exciting. Now the reason, Rula, that you are such a special guest, of course, you are George's first cousin. So when we asked you to be part of this, there was absolutely no way you were going to say no. I think it might have caused a rift between Melbourne and Houston, <laughs> should you have said no. I know there is such a special place in my heart for Australia because of George and his whole family. And anytime I can uh, connect with them, of course, I jump all over it. And I'm so proud of what you guys are doing. This is awesome. Thank you. And we are Thank so you. pleased to have you. Well, I'm excited. This is great. Anytime I get to talk about the fun stuff I get to do, I love to share the joy. Now, you have headphones on. You have a fancy looking mic there and a background <laughs> because, of course, your, your background is radio. So I'm going to give you a little introduction so our okay. Australian uh, listeners and viewers know a little bit more about you for those that don't. Rula was born and raised in Houston, Texas. She's the fourth of five children born to immigrant parents who moved to Houston from Tripoli in Greece in the 1950s. Rula says that she's a fluent Greek girl who can fast talk her way through most things. And so we're going to get a little taste of that today. Rula is a radio host on the Rula and Ryan show at 104.1 KRBE based in Houston. And she's live <laughs> on air every single morning. She also hosts the Weekends with Rula show, which is syndicated across the US. Rula has three gorgeous kids and is married to a great guy, Tassos, who has his own amazing impact story. And Tassos is going to be sharing that with us later on this morning. So again, welcome, Rula. Thank you, guys. To kick us off, Rula, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get into hosting a radio show in Houston? It's pretty um, unbelievable for even people who are in my industry, because for a lot of people in radio or television, they may have had that as a dream or a goal as young kids or young adults. I never had this on my radar ever, 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 ever. Since my um, dad came here in the 50s from Greece, he got into the restaurant business and we own the oldest seafood and steak restaurant in Houston, Texas. And because of that, five kids, Greek kids, were being raised in the restaurant. I thought my future was going to be the restaurant. I just didn't know that there was going to be something else. And um, when I was about 19 years old, I wasn't really loving it anymore. Like so much, you know, just rough. I bartended and I waited tables. I worked in the kitchen. Wasn't really crazy for it, but I had to work this one night and we had run out of strawberries for the cheesecake. Strawberry cheesecake is delicious, but you need strawberries. This was the golden road to radio. And the crazy thing is at the time when my sister told me, you need to run and get us some strawberries because we're running out. I had to borrow her car to get to the grocery store. And in the car, she had KRBE on the dial. And at the time, top 40 pop radio in America, it fluctuates with the kind of, um, it's a format. We call it a format, but sometimes within the format, it's going to be like pop radio, like boy band, or it'll be alternative. Like remember in the 90s, it was Nirvana and Pearl Jam and all that. So at the time, KRBE's pop radio was more alternative leaning and it wasn't my flavor. Like I wasn't into that. So I remember getting in her car and thinking, oh, you know, whatever, it's a short drive, I'll keep it on. The DJ that was on KRBE, his name was Paul Kelly Bryant. He, was, he came on the air for a break and he said that he's tired of ordering pizza. And if you work in a restaurant that delivers and you're listening, give us a call because I'd like some, to eat something different tonight. So I get the strawberries. I get back in the car. KRBE is still on. And he comes back on and says it again, that he's still looking for restaurants to fax him. Faxes, guys. <laughs> and so I get to Christie's, that's the name of the restaurant, Christie's Seafood and Steaks. And I walk in with the strawberries. I tell my sisters, hey, this DJ on the radio is looking for food. Maybe if I call him, we can get like a free advertisement plug or something. I mean, who doesn't want a free plug? So I call the radio station and I don't know from your younger days, have you ever tried doing that? It's almost impossible to get a dial to like a ring, right? It, rang, it answered on the first ring. And the girl that answered the phone said, you know, can I help you? And I said, oh, we have this restaurant. It's not too far, actually. KRBE and Christie's are about four miles apart on the same stretch of road. And um, she goes, okay, fax us a menu. He calls back and he says, okay, we picked you guys. And then I'm like, oh my God, okay, what does that mean now? <laughs> so he orders food and I tell my sisters, Kathy and Maria, I'm going to take this food to this radio station. So just come with me. So the three of us go. Now think about it. Now I'm telling you the story now as a professional, but let's look at it from the outside. I'm 19. My sister's 21. My other sister's 23. 
So you got three cute girls bringing a radio DJ free food. Of course, we got invited into the studio. (laughs) So Cubby let us hang out for like an hour and a half. And the whole time I was like, oh my God, the fire for radio is on. Like, this is so much fun. But I didn't think the fun part was being on the mic. I just thought it was going to be fun to work at that radio station. So we became friendly with Cubby and over the the next few months, you know, he'd come to Christie's and we'd hang out or we'd go out to clubs and all these things where he was working. And then he got transferred to New York. He took a job in New York. And that's when I told him, I go, oh my God, I've been too embarrassed to tell you that I really think it's so fun to work at 104, but I thought you'd think I'm a weirdo since we're friends to ask to, to like, see how to get a job there. And he's like, well, you have a resume? I said, yes. He goes, oh, come on in. You know, I'll tell my boss. So I got an interview to answer the request lines. And literally my job for six hours was for $5 an hour. Hi, KRBE, what do you want to hear? And I had to write it on a paper log. And I'll never forget the first request that I got on the phone was for Soundgarden, Black Hole Sun. I had to check it off the on the boxes. And 10 years, 10 years from that time, I got the Rule and Ryan show on KRBE. It wasn't all that fast, but I mean, it got my foot in the door. I got thrown on the air one night when they didn't have somebody. And then from there, I just was available all the time. I told them, put me in coach, put me in coach, put me in coach. I would work two to 5 a.m. I'd work one to 7 a.m. I'd work midnight to 4 a.m. answering phones or running buttons. And it just snowballed. And then I was on all the time. In KRBE in America in 1998, or yeah, 1998, it was the first radio station in the United States to broadcast live on the internet. I didn't know that until the next step happened to me. I got a job. I got a phone call from a man in Philadelphia who was programming a top 40 station there. And he was looking for a new co-host for the morning show he was building. And he heard me on the internet on KRBE on the weekends when I was working weekends. And he said, I really like your voice. I think you're a good sound for our radio station. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess so. Totally blind, totally green, totally stupid. I fly to Philadelphia to meet them. I fall asleep because I'm not a morning person. I fall asleep in the car with the guy who's supposed to show me the city. And then they take me to the airport and they thought they'd never see me again. And then I called him. I go, oh, you know, I just want, you know, you know, it's good enough for Will Smith and Rocky. Good enough for me. You know, I'm cool. Y'all want to make this go further. They offered me the job. I did mornings in Philadelphia as my first full-time job for three years. We were number one. And that's what got me back to Houston and eventually back on KRBE to host my own show. Crazy. I love that story. I mean, what, what that story says to me, you know, it, it's, it was opportunistic, but there was also, once you had a taste of it, there was a fire in there and you just went, I'm going to go for it. And that is yes. awesome. Absolutely awesome. Tell us a little bit more about the Ruler and Ryan show. So obviously you started out in Philly with your own morning show and then you've come back now to- No, I, in Philly, I was on somebody else's show. It was called uh, Chio in the Morning. He was the main host and I was the co-host. And then we had two, other, two or three other players. And um, it, the people here in Houston who owned the company owned all these stations around the, the country and the Philadelphia company that owned Philly owned a Houston property. And they were like, why is there a Houston girl in Philadelphia kicking butt when we can have a Houston girl in Houston kicking Absolutely. butt? Absolutely. So I give them credit for having the foresight to get or having the um, the adventure in them to let a woman lead the show because universally around the world in radio, the man's name is first. It's like some man and a girl and the man is the main guy. And the girl usually is like, ha 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 ha. Here's my stupid X, Y, Z contribution while the guy talks that that was definitely absolutely 20 years ago, the role. And I remember saying to girls in radio, if you are the laugh box or the pardon my French, if you're the, they, they're hoeing you out and you're not okay with that, then you need to quit your job because women had been pigeonholed to either be laughing at the guy's jokes all the time or contributing personal bedroom information about themselves to give themselves some color. And I'm like, that's, you don't have to do that to be on the radio, but not a lot of girls had that chance. It wasn't until that one guy, and I will give him all the love in the world, Mark Sherman, who worked at that radio station, wanted to build a female-led show here in Houston. So he offered me that job and he offered me the chance to build my own show, which of course I jumped on it. So um, Ryan came into my world because uh, the same DJ that I got the food to, Paul Covey Bryant, he used to work with Ryan at KRBE. Ryan had moved to New York, then he'd moved to the West Coast. And um, that radio station said to me, 
what do you think of working with Ryan Chase? And I said, well, I mean, I've met him one time. I never worked with him. I mean, I used to listen to him on KRBE. I was a kid and, you know, working in the restaurant, washing the floors, and I'd listen to him on the radio. And they said, well, why don't we just try and, I mean, if you have anybody else you want to audition with, it's cool. We'll, we'll let you know, whatever, but can we bring him in and have you guys talk to each other for an hour? I said, sure. So they put us on, I flew in from Philly, Ryan flew in from California. We, wanna, we went on the air on an AM stick that had barely any reception. So nobody could hear us do this secret audition. And we just talked to each other for like an hour and a half. And I'd never really met him before. And they offered us the job to create the Rule and Ryan show. And that's what we did. And that was in 2003. And now wow. it's 2020 and we're still together. Rula, that, that, is, that is astounding. It's longer than some marriages. So well done to you both because seriously, that, that is a long time to be working with someone. And I have tuned into your show of an evening mm -hmm. and, um, and it's fantastic. So I think, oh, you know, and what I love about what you just said there is the role modeling that you've, you've taken on that role around, hey, people that are out there in radio, particularly if you feel that you've had to play a particular role, you don't. And I think the tone yeah. that you've set um, in the industry, I know that you, the work that you do, um, particularly in the US, you know, you, you mentor a lot of people that are in radio, you present to a lot of them around some, you know, conferences and forums. When we first chatted, you spoke yeah. about that. So the role that you play as a, as a role model cannot be underestimated, particularly for women that are coming through um, in, in radio and media. I am, um, one of the things that I love most that I have seen um, from you as I have come to know you more is uh -huh. pantry powwow time. Now, if people don't know what pantry powwow time is, go and follow Ruler on Instagram and you will see yes. Ruler's pantry powwow times. Pantry Can you tell us a little bit more? Okay, Pantry Pow Wow was born from exactly what it is. I have a pantry in my house uh, and it has a door that closes. Um, it's hashtag Pantry Pow Wow. And I just started saying that because with three kids in the house, you barely have time as a mom or as a parent to find any quiet time. And so if the kids were, you know, watching a show or the kids were playing, I would go into the pantry. And the first time I ever did a Pantry Pow Wow, it's because I wanted to eat these cookies that I didn't want them to eat because, you know, they're not allowed to have any sugar, but I wanted some. And I was thinking, how am I going to eat this? So I closed the door and I was on, I just got on Instagram and I was like, listen, I'm hiding for my children because I really want to eat these cookies. And I'm like, man, these are really good. These are really good. And it just kind of grew from there. I always want to go in the pantry and have a minute to myself. And it's always one minute videos because Instagram live uh, videos, you know, one minute. And then I, I just hate having to do the tap, tap, tap. So if I can't say in a minute, it's not going to happen. So I've built a lot of hashtag pantry powwows over time. And once Tasso's, my husband came in there and, you know, he scared me and we were just, you know, kind of hugging on each other. And you could hear my five-year-old at the door and she goes, what are you guys doing in there? And we're like, nothing, we're cleaning. Go pay some bills or something. And she goes, what? No, you're not, open the door. <laughs> it's just really funny. Hashtag pantry powwow. It's been a little bit since I've done one. So I'm gonna have to go back in that pantry and go find There's some challenge. zen time as a mama. There's your challenge this afternoon. Another pantry powwow session. <laughs> Rula, just, just on parenting, you've got three gorgeous kids. From your own, uh, you know, from your own time, you know, in childhood as a child, mm -hmm. growing up in the restaurant, what lessons have you uh, taken, I guess, into your own parenting style now that you have your kids? Gosh, I was just thinking that this morning, Rita, because um, with the pandemic, I'm broadcasting from home, hence my super awesome studio radio closet. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I have missed in my years as a mother being on the air in the mornings is I'm never here in the morning when they wake up. But now with COVID, I'm the one that gets to wake them up. And every morning I go wake them up. I tell them how much I love them. And I give them kisses and kisses and kisses. And it's never like a rough wake up. Like, come on, we're late for school. Because they're also virtually schooling. And I was thinking to myself, I like to do the things that I didn't know I was missing as a child. And through no fault to my parents. Because they did the best they could. All of our parents did the best they could with the tools they had. My mom had five kids and no help. She's not going to sit there and cuddle me and kiss me for 10 minutes to wake me up. She's like, let's go. We're going to be late, right? So I think to myself, like, I want to nurture and love, love on my kids as much as I can so that they know that they are loved. Not to the point where I'm smothering them or helicoptering too much, but just I feel like you grow up as such a stronger adult if you absolutely know a true fact is in your life that your parents love you. And I, I know my parents love me and I know my parents are proud of me, but I didn't know it when I was little. I know it now. I didn't know it when I was little. So I make sure to tell my own kids 
I want them to know I'm proud of them. I want them to know that they are creative <clears throat> or, you know, what they tried to do. At least you tried it. It's better than not trying it. You know, I just try and really be in tune with their feelings. That is awesome. And Rula, how do you balance that um, motherhood and I guess the big responsibility of the show as well? So can you take us through a, a day in the life of Rula? Well, I'll tell you, George, the uh, mom guilt is strong and I'm still traumatized for my own mistakes or missteps in mothering and being a radio person. Because I always say on the radio, I saw this years ago and I don't know who said it to give them credit, but you are expected to mother like you don't have a job and you are expected to work like you do not have children. And this is the biggest, biggest obstacle in my life. So a COVID regular day versus our other regular day, I'll give you a regular day pre-COVID because I had more of those years than the last nine months. A regular day pre-COVID, I will wake up at four o'clock in the morning. The house is quiet. So in the darkness, I will stumble through the, to the bathroom to not wake up my husband. And I will get myself ready, a, a, a whispers level of water running and whatnot. I grab my coffee. I grab some fruit or something to get out the door to get to the radio station by 445, 5. And then the show starts at 6 a.m. So from 5 to 6, 5, 15 to 6, whatever, you kind of just show prep. You know, everything that happened overnight in the world, you basically have to consume it in 45 minutes. Then we do four hours of show. Then we do, and it's not just me and Ryan. I've got a fantastic producer that I always say I would never be able to do radio without because I've, I've become so dependent on him, Eric. And then we have other players, a girl named Sam and a guy named Kevin. They're just fantastic. So we have really good camaraderie. It's a good time. Four hours goes pretty fast. And then we have meetings because it's a business. You know, we have clients and appearances and, you know, example, like one time I finished the show, I did the meeting. I had to get glammed up. I had to go MC this fashion show for one of the clients for the radio station. My son was getting out at 12 o'clock. My daughter was getting out at one o'clock and my other daughter was getting out at three o'clock. And I was like, okay. I mean, I do have a nanny, obviously, because how else can I do this? I leave the house at five. My husband would leave at six. Somebody needs to be with the children. But I still wanted to be the one to get them, you know, because the kids always want to see mommy versus somebody else. So I just would get whatever I need to do after the show. And, uh, and then it was all about the mercy of the clock for the three different pickups from preschool time and kindergarten and stuff and, um, try and find something to eat in between there, maybe exercise. And then, <laughs> and then when you pick them up, then you start the grind again, get some grocery shopping done. You know, they want to go to the park and play or whatever it is. And then we wind down around five o'clock is dinner kid crunch time. I call it kid bath crunch time, get the dinner ready, get them showered, get them fed. And then. You know, by the time they get to bed, hopefully by 8.30, you know, they start the rigmarole at 8, and then maybe they'll be asleep by 9, and then you're like, whew, okay, now i got to wash the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> now let me do some laundry. <laughs> so then I'm scrolling social media at 10.30 when I finally get to bed to do my own thing, and then people say, how are you emailing me at 11 o'clock at night? I go, well, that's the one time I had for me, and then I pass out, and I do the whole thing over again. <laughs> Rula, we had one of our guests yesterday that was talking about um, – uh, her life was uh, pre-kids and post-kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, pre-kids, she would give herself two hours to finish a task. But post-kids, you have to get everything finished in 15 minutes and then move on to the next thing. How has right. your life changed in terms of what have you learned about yourself post-kids? Because obviously the, the role is quite demanding. Mm -hmm. So what have you learned about yourself over the years and what do you hope to impart back to the kids as well? You know, George, I learned it better with the second child than the first, because I agree with your speaker. Pre-kids and post-kids is a different thing. You have different priorities, right? I mean, everybody does. And I will use my oldest daughter as a great example. When I had my first baby, um, I hired a nanny immediately after she was born because I had to go back to work in six weeks. I only had six weeks maternity leave. So um, when she got into pre-K, she was 18 months old and they had called me at the on my cell phone i was at the radio station after the show recording something for the next day that we needed to do like an interview and um she i could hear her crying in the background and the teachers on the phone she had put her hand on this caterpillar like it's called an asp asp i'd never heard of it before it camouflages with the tree and it's very prickly like a porcupine caterpillar so her entire hand had been inflamed and she's screaming crying and they're saying you know we're really sorry but this happened and you need to come pick her up because she's really sad and she's crying a lot we just put some ice and give her some benadryl and it, and i said oh my gosh okay a normal woman would have said i have to leave right now my three-year-old is freaking out at preschool. She's been stung by this thing. I have to go save her. Instead, my work brain had taken over because I was in work zone. And I said, okay, as soon as I finish recording this, 
then I can leave. Do you know that happened six years ago? And it still traumatizes me that why did I not just drop everything and go to that child? Because I had to finish what I was recording because work zone brain was on. And I knew that, well, she's already been stung and she's already crying. The extra five minutes is not going to change anything, but this will ruin them if I stop this interview. So ever since then, I have made sure to get what I need done, but when it's really important, just stop what you're doing and attend to the child. Give them your attention and let them know that you are hearing them. Tassos and I have had to hear that, to learn that about ourselves. You hear them. Like, it's one thing when you hear somebody and you listen to them, but no, you're not hearing me. Like I told you, my hand hurts. Okay, 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 I'll get you a bed. No, no, you're not hearing me. There was a screwdriver in my hand, it hurts, you know? So that's what I learned, George, like pre and post kids, Really, like, you've got to turn off the work brain sometimes, even when before you could do it all the time. But with a kid, you have to react immediately and put them first. And sometimes it's not always, I mean, you got to kind of balance it. But, man, that one really kills me. When the ass stung Alexandra's hand and I still didn't leave right away to say, drop everything, I have to run. I finished what I was doing and then I went to her and her hand was inflamed and she just wanted mommy hugs and I had to cradle her the rest of the day. And it was a terrible, terrible, terrible sting. And I still remember it and she probably forgot it. (laughs) The mom guilt is strong. Just really take care of the important things in the moment so you're not you know, killing yourself later mentally over it. Can I just, just focus on that as well, Rula? And, and that's the, mm-hmm. and all of us as parents, by the way, at some, at some stage we've got the guilt over something with the kids and you think we've just scarred the kid for life. Yes. Um, what, what advice can you provide to not only mothers, but also fathers that might be in that similar situation where, you know, they're torn between the, what they think they need to do compared to what they must do. So. What advice do you provide, particularly given everything that's happening at the moment, where we are working from home? Yeah. Working from home or is it living at work? I'm not quite (laughs) sure. But um, what advice could you provide to parents out there um, that obviously you've worked through in your mind and helped you as you've gone on? The thing that I've taught myself, George, over the last year especially is – you know how many times like your children are asking you something and you're working and you're saying, okay, 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 okay. I'll get to it in a second. I'll get to it in a second. Or maybe you've lost your temper one too many times and uh, you feel like, oh God, I've scarred them for life. Like you said, if you don't make those the core memories, it's going to happen. They're going to remember when mom and dad got mad. But if the good outweighs the bad, you will not be raising a damaged adult. As long as you acknowledge that you made a mistake. I tell my husband all the time, we have to remind ourselves, if we are having a passionate disagreement about something and the kids are hearing us and they're not really sure what we're talking about. Well, also we're Greek and we talk loud. So we're just talking to each other. They might think we're fighting, but you know, that's a whole sidebar. Um, you know, we go to them after it's all said and done. And I ask them, you know, did you hear us talking? Do you have any questions? You know, what do you think we were talking about? Just because you can feel it from your kids when they're not comfortable and they don't want to ask you because they're scared. So as long as the good core memory outweighs the bad core memory, you're not going to damage them. Just make sure you acknowledge when something bad has happened so they feel like they've met, they matter and you care that they have been affected. That's the best thing I could say I've taken from the last like maybe 18 months. And I, I okay. must say the, uh, the talking loud when we're speaking, I think it's in our DNA. So I thought I'd just yes, totally. leave that with you. It's in ours too. <laughs> I had to get my husband a t-shirt that says, I'm not yelling, I'm just Greek. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get me one of those that says, I'm not yelling, I'm just Italian? Please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rola, just, just to um, uh, shift direction in the conversation, um, mm-hmm. you've mentioned that you've been with KIB now for uh, a number of years. 17. Yeah, 14 years. Yeah, yeah. 14 years. So what is it about your connection with the audience, with the people of Houston, that um, yeah, makes it so special? Um, you know, every time you talk about your role, every time you talk about your city, there's this passion that I see come out in the way that you talk about um, Houston. What's the secret? What is it about you and the connection with the, with the people of Houston? Well, I'm just proud of my city. I feel like we have so much to offer that, I mean, just the way you guys are proud of Melbourne. I mean, when I came to Melbourne, I mean, our family is very proud of Melbourne, dude. I mean, I learned a lot about how much more awesome Melbourne is than maybe the other cities in the world that get some shine. You know, I just feel like when you come from such a diverse city and people don't know enough about it, I mean, we are the most diverse city in the United States. We have more languages spoken in Houston, Texas than any other city in America. 
We have people coming from all over the place. Our population grows constantly. I just have Houston pride, but really the connection with my audience, George, is because I've been on the air for so many years and the nature of my show is not a political talk show or like a view or Oprah type talk show. We're just focusing on one subject for an hour, two hours, three hours. It is a fast moving show about nothing. If it's like, if it could be the 2020 version of a radio Seinfeld show, it's really about whatever happens. I mean, I'm living, I'm working 24 seven because things that happen to me throughout the day turn into radio material the next day. And because of that, since we're long form talk versus quick radio hit talk, you know, usually at DJs after morning show day parts in America, um, they have like quick ins and outs between songs, but morning shows in America are more long form like mine is. So we can go for 15, 20 minutes and chat about a topic. And in that people learn about us personally. So there are a lot of Houstonians that I've run into when they don't realize it's me, but they recognize my voice. And they're like, how do I know you? Like I was in a department store two years ago and there was a girl on the other side of the rack and I had asked a question to the sales lady and then she looks at me and she goes, and it says nothing. And then I noticed her cause she perked up and then I kept shopping and she goes, I'm sorry, how do I know you? Maybe we work together. And then I go, Oh, I don't know. Where do you work? <laughs> I don't work with her. And so I said, I said, do you listen to the rule and Ryan show? She goes, Oh my God, that's you. And it's because people, they go, Oh my God, you're my best friend and you've never met me. I go, because I've said the things that happened to my life and that people relate to them. I mean, in my Houston audience met me when I was a single girl and having, you know, getting ribbed by the guys on the air about terrible bad dates that I had or a guy that stood me up or a guy that forgot his wallet on the date, Ugh, stupid, all the way into uh, my sister set me up with this guy that lives in Dallas and I'm sure it's going to go nowhere, but I guess I'll go out with him. And oh, really? We got married. And oh, really? We have three kids now. <laughs> you know, my, my father became um, uh, in, into the weaved into the fabric of my show. He even got a nickname. My dad's name was Jim Christie. We called him Papa Love on the air because his first visit to my show was Valentine's Day, Friday. And um, we asked dad, can you just give people some advice, dad? Maybe people can take some advice from you. And uh, we we coined him Papa Love when this woman called up my show, guys, and she has five children by the same man, but he has cheated on her multiple times. And she was asking my dad, Mr. Christie, what do you think I should do? I mean, he keeps promising he won't do it again, but he does it all the time. And I kind of was uncomfortable for my dad because I was thinking, this is really like mainstream stuff for my dad. You know, like, what's he going to say? And my dad, with his gorgeous, deep, accented voice, says, Really slowly, he thinks about it. He goes, it sounds like you have a glass. Let me try and do his best impression. It sounds like you have a glass with a crack. It holds the water, but it leaks. So you need to throw it away. <laughs> Brilliant, Dad. Brilliant. Yeah. So we called him Papa Love. Yeah. People knew Papa Love. Dad would check in every now and then, come to the studio. My mom would bring him. And then my dad passed away. And it was like a gut punch to my audience. It was like they cried just as much as I did. You know, when I got married, people cried tears of joy. I had my first baby. I was in the studio with my second daughter. My water broke. So everyone's like, ah! to the hospital. I mean, <laughs> people know us as much as they know about me. They know about Ryan. They know about Eric. They know about the other players on the show. We have really weaved ourselves into the fabric of this city. Somebody actually called us the heartbeat of Houston. And we use that now because right. I feel like that is such an honor. And it's very flattering to be that important to some people, you know, in this pandemic, when people have lost their minds, financial crisis, family crisis, and all these things, the one thing people said have kept them sane is that we have stayed on the air because if nothing else in your world was able to be controlled, you could control that you could turn on KRBE and you will hear the rule on Ryan show Monday through Friday. So it was comfort for them. And I feel like that's what's kept us very successful in this city where, you know, like Rita said, 17 years, some marriages don't last that long. And the fact that me and Ryan and Eric came together in 2003, and then we are still together now and we just signed a five year deal. So we're still together another five years. <laughs> you know, it's really exciting. Rula, is there ever a moment where, I mean, you've talked um, so much about, you know, how much the city knows you and, and having spent mm -hmm. now a little bit of time with you, you are so giving as an individual. Is there ever, do you ever have moments where you just want to go to ground a bit and maybe not give as much as what you do? Yeah, I have, I've had some uh, moments maybe in the last couple of years where I didn't realize how fast I was going. 
you know, it's always go, 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 go. And you just never rest or don't have a bad day or just can't take time for yourself. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't pinpoint exactly the last time I took a break to let myself just have some me time. But there was a point where I felt like I was trying to do everything and I had all the plates spinning and I was trying to keep them all from falling. And you just can't live like that. It's impossible. So I would just say, you know, let's say I had to go be somewhere and I'd be like, you know what? I really feel bad. I can't go to that. But if I go to that, it's going to de- be detrimental to my to me later. So I'm going to just step back and say I can't come to that or I can't go to that event, but, and I'll say like, look, I can talk about your event and give it exposure, but I can't come to your event or, you know, for whatever reason. I mean, everybody wants a little piece of something and they don't realize that a little piece here, a little piece there might add up to a lot for you and you don't realize it either. So that sometimes you have a breaking moment. Other times you just get that revelation. I was like, wow, I really need to slow down. I need to take a break. I need to rest. So I can't pinpoint exactly, but I know they've happened for so, sure. So Rula, does it mean that you are a better plate spinner? Or do you just oh, a million spin, percent. Or a million percent. do you spin fewer plates? Um, I think I'm a better plate spinner because I realized when I got to about 10, you know, like when you're trying to stack something, you're like, oh, let's try and put one more cup. But that's probably going to fall over. I know now, George, when to stop adding plates. I'll still spin them like crazy, but I just know not to add any more of those. Rula, can I just go back? You mentioned um, the Houstonians. Uh, referred to you as the heartbeat of Houston. Mm-hmm. Given what's happening in recent months uh, and the turmoil, how much work goes into promoting positive messages when you are on air? Was it more organic for uh, with you and Ryan? You know, it's pretty organic, George, but I'll tell you, you know, this year in America especially, not just because of COVID. I mean, think of what we've gone through as a nation with politics and um, the George Floyd murder. I mean, that right there, I mean, the world, right? I mean, what really got me is when I saw other countries had George Floyd's face on murals and things. And, you know, George Floyd was from, George Floyd was from Houston and he was buried in Houston. And I didn't realize that how crazy that connection is. But with all of that going on, we are an organic show, but we also know when it's time to, uh, and we like to be a release for people, but we also know when we have to stop it down and talk about that. And we will even say like, look, we are usually not a political show, but we absolutely are going to take this show today to talk about what is happening. And for the George Floyd situation, we did an entire show about that by opening our phones up to the audience to call in about whatever they want to say. And even asking questions that you otherwise would kind of be, well, I don't know if I want to ask that question. Is that uh, that too uh, right in line of not being politically correct? But we really put it out there because the audience trusts that we will do it with class and with taste and not with any offense. You know, you, you, you just want people to be heard. So we had people calling in from all races. We had cops calling in. We had uh, spouses of police officers calling in. We had mothers Black mothers call in about the fear they have for their black sons. And, um, you know, you, we did an entire show like that. So we recognize that although we always want to be like your, your fun corner to decompress with when it gets serious, you, you know if the Rule and Ryan show has stopped down to an entire show about something, stuff is getting real because people know the nature of our show. So for us, you know, kind of like when I, for 9-11, I mean, 9-11 was crazy. I was on the air in Philadelphia live by myself when that happened. And for the next two weeks, we didn't do regular programming. It was just open phones and talk about it and things like that. Or, you know, when serious stuff happens, we have to stop it down to let people be heard. You know, we know that we can do that too. And we recognize that. And you've mentioned that to me over the years when you spoke about that September 11, when you, you were on air in Philly. Um, mm-hmm. Drawing on that, and that may be one, and not that we want to pick out the best worst situation, but you know, right. what are some of the more difficult times that you've had on air that you felt, you know what, well, I need to really dig deep uh, into my reserves to make sure that I hold it together? Oh, gosh. I mean, 9-11, obviously, but I think because that was so weird for the whole world, you didn't know when it was going to hit you until it hit you. So, and I was still new in mornings then. I wasn't as seasoned. So I just remember breaking down like the third day, probably like November 14th is when I actually cried on the radio. And it's not like, you know, keep calm and carry on all the time. I mean, if you did not 
you could have cried privately or cried off the air. But the thing that got me on the air is when we were hearing audio from people because Philadelphia and New York, what people have to understand is you can live in Philly and you work in New York. You just take the train in. You know, it's almost like a suburb, if you want to say. Not exactly a suburb, but this does happen. I had listeners in my area who worked in New York or had family who worked in New York. So when those people were calling and looking for their missing loved ones after day three, I mean, by day three, we pretty much figured out there is no one to find. That's when I broke down on the air. And I felt okay with that because that's what everybody else was feeling. There are other times I really want to keep it together if we have a guest in studio that is talking about like the loss of a child or a tragic event, you know, you don't want to distract too much by always boohooing, but when it hits you and it hits you in the right way, meaning like at the, in the perfect spot where you were just getting choked up and you're just in touch with that person. The last time I cried on the radio was just two days ago, which totally caught me by surprise. But you know, the death of Eddie Van Halen from Van Halen, he died of cancer. His son Wolfgang is his only child. And his son Wolfgang played with him. They, they toured together. They had this great history. He was a fan, he's a fantastic musician. He released a song called Distance that he wrote after his dad died. And it's, when you hear the lyrics, it's really about if you lost a parent or anybody, you know, he says, it doesn't matter the distance, we'll always be together. At the end of that song, he has a voicemail from Eddie Van Halen that he pulled from his phone. And he says, I just wanted to hear your voice. I just love you so much. And he kisses him in the voicemail and says, just call me when you can. And it just killed me because I even said on the radio, oh my God, I think things didn't get me like this. Because my dad passed away in 2013. It's Thanksgiving time in America. The date of my dad's passing was November 26, which is Thanksgiving in America this year. So it was already kind of weighing in the back of my head. And, and it was my son's birthday. He was born almost one year to the day I lost my dad. And it was just a lot, a lot, a lot. And it just came crashing out of my face on the air. And I was like, you know, really sobbing. And Ryan's lost his dad. He lost his dad on Christmas day, 14 years ago. Eric lost his dad when he was 24 or 25. And so none, nobody was talking. And I said, somebody say something, somebody say something. And, you know, they said the same thing. They were also choked up. That's why they couldn't talk because they were crying about their own dads. And people were just flooding us with texts like, oh my God, my heart is with you. And Anybody has lost a parent, really, if you lost any loved one, but especially a parent, when your friend loses their parent, you relive your loss all over again because you know exactly what they're feeling. So, yeah, I, I lost it, man. <laughs> I just was, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get collected. And then the next hour when I talked about Eddie Van Halen, not a tear, not a tear. I already had it out of my system, but man, that really caught me by surprise. And um, you just never know when you're going to get it. Sometimes just lean into it. Just lean into it. Because if you're trying to fight it, it sounds bad. I'm not crying. What are you talking about? I'm not crying. Or what if I said nothing, guys? What if I was motioning to the Zoom like, don't talk to me. I'm crying. That's worse than if I just told the audience what's happening to me. Because then yeah. everybody related to that or, you know, they made them think with their own family. Especially in COVID, you can't hug your loved ones right now it sucks because if you lost your loved one they're not here that's bad but it's worse that they're here and you still can't hug them yeah. so just i don't know we're in a weird spot we are in a weird spot uh rule absolutely and uh certainly here in melbourne we've had our fair share of uh being locked away for uh 112 days 112 days but um we are it's about resilience and, and i think that's the message that um you're sharing with us is that the more authentic that you are on air, mm -hmm. then the more impact that you have with the audience and, and the more chance that they just, they don't tune in because they want to listen to the music, they tune in because they just want to hear an insight, uh, hear your story. And when we're driving into work and you've got the radio on, it's an extension of them uh, in terms of what they're yes. listening to on the radio. We have had a question come through on the socials, uh, Ruler, yes. and the question is from Patty. How much of your personal life do you share on air? And is there anything you wouldn't talk about? Is there a no-go zone? <laughs> um, before I was married, pretty much everything was an open book. And uh, when I first started Patty and Radio, I had gotten stood up, stood up on a date, and I was so devastated by being stood up on the date, I did not want to talk about it. And it wasn't until two days later when finally my, my co-host, like, kind of pulled it out of me like what happened you told us you were going to go out with this guy and then you just said nothing about it and that's when I learned the audience taught me you can share private things that you think are embarrassing or humiliating because everybody's been there there's at least one person listening 
who's had the same thing happen to them. And that's where I learned the relatability factor of the audience. So I did say, do you want to know what happened to that stupid guy? He didn't show up. Yeah, I just was there for three hours alone. Like it was terrible, terrible, terrible. And um, I used to be an open book on that stuff. But then when I got married, you know, I was dating Tassos and we got married, you know, there's a respect level and a respect line to your family. And Tassos was in radio in Dallas. That's how my sister connected us for the blind date. I did not know him in radio, but he had heard of me and I, and he said, oh yeah, yeah, I know who your sister is, whatever. And okay, maybe give her, give me, give her my number. And after a series of crazy events, we eventually had the blind date, but I, um, because he knows radio he really is a fantastic partner in life and for things I want to bring to the show. Like he'll call in if I'm talking about how, if I see a set of Tasso socks rolled up into a ball under the bed one more time, I'm going to lose my brains. And then he'll call in and be like, what about the dental floss? What about the <laughs> dental floss that you leave in the sink? <laughs> you know, like, he's really good at playing with me on, on that, right? But um, the average guy probably might not want that on the radio. So even Talsos and I have things that we feel is not for everyone. So we do have our boundary lines and it's really just a feeling. But most everything is an open book. And now, Patty, I'm going to a new level with my children because my nine-year-old had something happen to her that she immediately said, to me guys you're not going to talk about this on the radio are you mommy and i'm like oh man yeah, you actually was, pay attention now she's on to you yeah. that was a disclaimer from the nine-year-old to say don't you dare yeah. mom don't you dare right don't tell them that mama it's like okay ruler one of the advantages of working on krb is you get to interview and meet some amazing people can you share with us uh, your favorite celebrity that you've interviewed or met Ooh. Gosh, I have a lot of good ones. I have a lot of good ones. Um, okay, well, uh, it just really depends on what the music is doing at the time. And I have built a relationship with some of these artists because being in radio for a long time, they come to recognize you if you interview them, you interview them every now and then. And I had built a rapport with Enrique Iglesias because he started like in 98 or 99. 99, I think, was his first American album. And that's the first time we met. And then, you know, he went to Philly to do a concert and he saw me and then he came to Houston and I was in New York for something and he saw me. And so when Enrique sees me, it's like, Roland Enrique, we had this little new thing. But one of my um, more fun interviews has been a surprise. I was pregnant with my second child about six or seven months along. George Clooney came to Houston for this lecture series. It was pretty fantastic. And I was like, oh my God, George Clooney. And it was not a KRBE interview. I was going there because I wanted to see him in this lecture series. But because of I work at KRBE, I got to go to this little pre-lecture mixer with him. And um, I mean, y'all, I, I could feel my daughter jumping. Like I felt like she was in my throat. Like her foot was in my throat. I was so excited. My heart was racing. The child's foot was in my throat. I could not take it. I just was like, oh my God. And as and it was my turn to go say hi to him, George Clooney just comes right to me and puts his hands right on my belly bum. He was like, oh, okay, well, what's going on here? Like, is it a boy or a girl or when do you do? And I was like, oh my God, your hands are so soft. Please keep touching my stomach. <laughs> and what woman would want George Clooney to touch her stomach? Like there's way too many wobbly bits there, ladies. Let's be honest, unless there's spanks all over that. But the belly bump is the best prop I've had in radio the best prop. And he was so nice. And it was so enjoyable to speak to him about just, I don't even remember, honestly, what I just remember his hands were so soft. And I was thinking, oh my God, George Clooney's on my belly. And he was just really nice. He was interested in what I do and what we're doing and what he was here for. And I don't know, I just, whew, I'm getting, I'm getting. It's getting, I'm getting hot, hot in that closet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Rula, um, what's next? For you, what are, what are aspirations for you moving forward? Mm, you know, I'm pretty happy that I got my syndicated show, George, because I feel like I've known for a few years that I, it's not a, it's not something that's, um, I'm not going to say it in an arrogant way because I'm trying to portray it. When you know you have something that is a good contribution to the world, you want to share that, right? So I feel like what I've been doing on the Rule and Ryan show all these years, I'm very proud of it. And I'm, and I'm proud now that I got the national platform for my personality to come out. And I feel like I'm, who knows where this goes next. I, and one thing I can tell you guys about my entire career, I never planned it. 
I never planned what's happened to me. I didn't sit around hoping to God someone gives me a morning show one day. I didn't even know what radio was until I took the shrimp to the KRBE. So every step that I've had has just happened for me in, um, I feel like it's a gift, honestly, because I didn't plan it. You know, I didn't plan, 2020 has been a horrific year for a lot of people, but for me personally, I should not complain. I'm healthy. My children are thriving in virtual school. I was gifted with a nationally syndicated U.S. show in COVID, and I'm, I'm broadcasting fantastically from my house to keep the routine for my city. So I just never planned it, but I'm very happy that I could do it. So what I hope is next is something even better, but right now it's pretty darn good. <laughs> so I don't know the answer to that, but I just hope good things. And when are you coming back to Australia? It's a rhetorical oh question because we don't George, know, this do was we? the year, George. George, this was the year. Last December, 2019, Tassos has a cousin that lives in, in um, um, oh my God, Manly Beach, Manly Beach. Yes. That's where she lives. She met him. She's from Ohio. She met a man from Manly Beach. They're married. And last December, they had come to visit us for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I said, oh my God, I want to take the kids to Australia so bad and see my family. And he said, you know, the Australian um, tourism board, I bet we could probably make, make something work. Would y'all could probably do your show from Australia. I go, hell yeah. <laughs> and I told the gang on the air, I go, guys, next December, three weeks in Australia, we're broadcasting the Rule and Ryan show from Australia. And then screeching halt with COVID. So I'm hoping maybe let's make a goal for December, 2021. Because yeah. believe me, I've told my children my stories about my wonderful times in Australia. The fact, I don't think Rita knows this. I went to Australia, Rita, for the first time when I was between gigs. The first station that brought me to, to Houston was another station. And then I was in talks with KRBE. And I remember being on your brother's couch, George, and I was taking calls from my agent about yes. things we're going to do next. And I remember saying to uh, my kids as, I, as they've been growing up, like, guys, we're going to go to Australia. There's all these great things. I loved it so much those six weeks I was there, Rita, that my next break, I went, I had six days off. I flew to Melbourne. Oh, I had awesome. a six day vacation and it took me two days to get there <laughs> and a day and a half to come back. All I needed was two days. I just want to smell it. I just want to smell it. I just oh, want to smell it. <laughs> we love that you love Australia, Rula, and, and particularly I love Melbourne, it. if we're biased, particularly Melbourne, but you are welcome back any any time. Absolutely welcome back. Can I tell you one thing? And I don't know if this is, I hope I'm not offending anybody, but famous last words. I always compare Melbourne to Houston and Dallas to Sydney because Dallas gets the attention for Texas. They had a soap opera where JR got shot and they have the Cowboys. But Melbourne and Sydney always gets the glory because the opera house and Finding Nemo. But I feel like the real jewel is exactly where you guys are. And people don't know that unless they've been there. Yes. Same thing with Houston. Now, when you get my husband on, I'm sure he's going to throw some shade on this because <laughs> he's a Dallas boy. But I don't hold that against him. I mean, I love him. I went to school in Dallas for a year. It was fine. But I just feel like when people around the world hear about Texas, they think Dallas. When people around the world hear about Australia, they think Sydney. But really, you got to dig deep for the true gems. And we're looking at our cities right now. Okay. The jewel in the crown. I like it. The jewel in the crown, which is Melbourne. Yeah. So we won't That's offend right. any Sydney ciders, but we think Melbourne's pretty awesome I, too. I've got a very quick story before we do wrap up. Uh, yes. When when Ruler was in Melbourne, uh, we were taking Ruler around to see the city. Ruler, please jump in if you remember this, and I'll probably hear your screech in the background. <laughs> we, we took Ruler to the Melbourne Museum. Oh, I love that museum. museum. <laughs> you love the museum. <laughs> And there was a section at the museum, which was the anatomy section. Uh, yes, I've never forgotten it ever in my life. And I think about it all the time. Like, how is that possible? That would never happen in the States. <laughs> so what, what do you recall of that? Because I don't want to, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I no, actually, never I'm curious forget... to know what your perception of it was. Cause I know I can tell you what I'm going to say after you tell me what you're going to say, because I don't remember how I reacted to you. Yeah. I just remember what I'm thinking in my mind, but you tell me your side and then I'll yeah. tell everyone my side. So Melbourne Museum, they had a special exhibition. It was an anatomy exhibition. And uh, at the entrance, they had a note to say, you know, be discreet. Just when you go in, particularly for the kids going in with the schools, so just be respectful when you get in there. And we right. walk in there and there are wax models stripped of their skin showing the anatomy. And ruler, totally naked. Totally naked. naked, boys and girls, yep. men and women from yep. all ages, totally naked with all their glory out. And I was like, yep. oh, oh, what was happening here? 
<laughs> so what I do remember is uh, Rola grabs my hand and goes, what kind of sickos are you here? <laughs> <laughs> I go, right, it's kids come, they learn about the human anatomy and it's education. She goes, no, no, this is not right. And I'll never forget that because just the screech that came out, I think you attracted the attention of security at one point, but that's do, another do story. George, I talk about that on the radio still. I go, oh my God, the Melbourne Museum is my favorite museum in the whole world, but they had this crazy display that is insane. Because Rita, at the time, the display had, like, let's say it was a six-year-old boy and a six-year-old girl. Then it was a 13-year-old boy and 13-year-old girl. <laughs> then it was like a 30-year-old man and a 30-year-old woman. And then it was like a, you know, maybe one in like their 60s and then one in their 90s. So it shows you the evolution of like all the horrible parts of you when they start like drooping and slooping and dripping and dropping. And I'm like, oh my God, and I'm like, these children are naked. What is happening in this place? I've never forgotten it. I've never forgotten it. <laughs> Have they done that since or did they realize it was probably a bad idea at the time? No, they've, probably, they've probably still got it. And um, it's just, they probably changed the name to the evolution of your bits rather than human anatomy. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, Rula, we have a couple of final questions. It's a tradition on Impactology sure. Live, mm -hmm. and the tradition started 24 hours ago, so uh, <laughs> now you're part of tradition. Yeah. So the first question is, uh, you are on a video call with your 18-year-old self. Mm -hmm. What advice would you provide young Rula? Oh, girl. Get a hair straightener, please. Also, find some Spanx. You're going to thank yourself for pictures later. Just kidding. I mean, true, but yes. Sometimes I look at my pictures when I was 18, I go, why was I wearing that? Like, what, what, what about this that made me think I was looking okay? But anyway, I would say you are going to be faced with a lot of crud, and uh, you're going to build a thick skin really fast. So just try and power through and don't let it damage you for life. Because we all, especially in this takedown culture of a world, I was blessed to grow up when there was not Instagram and there was not Twitter or Twitch or YouTube or Snapchat or whatever, right? No TikTok. So I don't have all my hellish times recorded for life. So my 18 year old self, I would just say, you know, put your seatbelt on. You're about to go for a ride. It kind of sounds unbelievable, but you're going to be just fine on the other side. That's what I would say. That's wonderful. And the second and final question is, um, it's a game of word association. Are you ready for it? Sure, go. Let's go. Okay. Family. Wait, I'm supposed to say the name of the family? Tell me again. How am I supposed to uh, do this? The when we say the word, what's the first word that pops into your mind? Uncensored. Oh, yeah. Family. Well, right now, it's on, it's on the brain. It's Thanksgiving, so it's being together. I guess I would just say Thanksgiving. I don't yeah. know. Just, I think of all my family together, so that's too long of an answer. It's sentence association with me, George. Okay, sorry, I talked for a living. Go, next that, one. That's okay, Rule. It's more than one word, but that's okay. We, that's okay. We, we're flexible. Uh, Houston. Okay. Home. Morning radio. Fun. Holiday. Don't say Madonna. No. <laughs> Holiday. Oh, Australia one day, hopefully. Dreams, holidays, dreams. Dreams of places I want to go. Relaxing. Oh, sleeping in for sure. Party? Uh, right now it's about sharks and dinosaurs. Any kind of party we have would be centered around children. So yeah, mm -hmm. shark cakes. <laughs> 2021. Hope for a better year i mean really i have a i'm very hopeful i am very hopeful about 2021 i feel like nobody could have guessed what 2020 was going to bring the world and i'm very hopeful that we've gotten through it and um we don't know how much longer we're going to go but if we had to keep going like this for another year i'm hopeful that we've already now been seasoned a bit so it's uh i'll be, we'll be fine rula thank you so much Love you very much and thank you for making the time and, and chatting with us. And um, we've got six minutes before Tassos comes uh, online for us to have a chat with him. So um, thank you so much. Ask him about, uh, I'm, this is going to be on my show tomorrow, I swear to God, guys. I'm going to hear how his story goes with the bread. Yes. And then I'm going to say, oh, it's like the newlywed game. Let me write down my answers. <laughs> Ask him about 
my dad and the kitchen counter when it came to the bread. Just see what he says. I bet we match, okay. or maybe we won't. I'll we watch his, too. Dad and kitchen yeah. counter. Uh, my other... dad and the kitchen counter, uh, the, the island. But thank you so much, guys. This has been fantastic. I'm super proud of you guys. I think this entire thing is an awesome idea, and I just can't wait to see what goes from here, and I can't wait to see the rest of your speakers. Thank you so much for making me part of it. I love you guys. So good to see you again, Rula. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank Thanks you. See you later. Have a good day. Bye. So soon, in about four minutes, actually, we've got Tassos joining us uh, again from the US. So we'll see you very soon.